here with the Commonwealth, and I have the privilege of introducing our next speaker, Brandon Keith. He is a cybersecurity architect for Appalachia Technologies. Uh, he joined Appalachia in 2018 as a cybersecurity architect, as I just mentioned. Uh, he has experience in both private and public, public sector IT consulting. And he has served in various roles in cybersecurity over the past 10 years, specifically specializing in ethical hacking, cybersecurity strategy, regulatory compliance, and cyber defense. He's also taught cybersecurity classes for a world leading cybersecurity boot camp based out of Chicago and is active in the local cybersecurity community, currently chairing the PA Hackers Cybersecurity Meetup Group. Uh, Brandon has earned his master's degree in cybersecurity and information assurance from Western Governors University and a bachelor's of science from Central Penn College in information technology and holds a number of certifications including certified ethical hacker, certified hacking forensics investigator. He is also currently a subject matter expert for the electronic, uh, I'm sorry, the EC Council and provides feedback and guidance on exam material and topics. Brandon is going to present for us today frameworks and how they can lead to a cybersecurity strategy and uh, talk a little bit with us about what the benefits of a cybersecurity framework could be and what some of its components are. So with that, Brandon, welcome. Good afternoon. Uh, clearly the food wasn't poisoned because you all made it back, so excellent. So today, we're going to talk about what is a framework. We hear this a lot. We talk about cybersecurity frameworks. Uh, we gave a nod to it in this morning's presentation. We're going to talk about the how. We've talked a lot about why cybersecurity is an issue in the industry how it affects all of us. Now we're going to kind of talk about how we build that roadmap and what tools we have to help us build a cybersecurity roadmap. So uh, we're going to talk about what is NIST. For anyone who's not heard of NIST before, we're going to talk about specifically the NIST cybersecurity framework and what are the benefits of the NIST cybersecurity framework. Something that we're going to emphasize today is we want to use a cybersecurity framework that gets out of your way, so to speak. We don't want a framework that slows us down. We want one that can match our organization and work within the confines of our organization uh, rather than being an impedance on our cybersecurity program. So what is a framework, right? Well, if you think of a framework for a house, right? We want to build a house. We have to have some framework up to build that house. You think of frameworks when we're talking about application development. There's application development frameworks that allow you to rapidly build applications. Really, when we're talking about a framework, we're talking about a way of doing things, a roadmap, right? We're talking about structure. You wouldn't build a house without a plan, or at least I hope you wouldn't. It wouldn't be very structurally sound. Uh, you wouldn't build a bridge without a plan, but yet, again, in the industry, we seem to continually be attacking cybersecurity without a coherent plan. Uh, this is something that we in the industry, I think, need to work on better, and NIST is going to help us get there. So what is NIST? NIST stands for National Institute of Standards and Technology. They were founded in 1901, and they are currently part of the U.S. Department of Commerce. The NIST cybersecurity framework was developed as a collaborative effort involving industry, academia, and government, built for improving cybersecurity of critical infrastructure as part of the Cybersecurity Enhancement Act of 2014. Uh, which basically means that Congress realized this is an issue, we need to work on this, there was an act, so NIST create these standards for critical infrastructure, right? So the cybersecurity framework was built for critical infrastructure, but it works in all segments of government and business and can be utilized by any company or organization. So what is it that NIST cybersecurity framework seeks to do, we want to describe our current cybersecurity posture. You need to know where you're at before you can improve, right? We need to describe the, the target state of where we want to go. What is our ideal cybersecurity stance for our organization? We want to identify 
identify and prioritize opportunities for improvement with, context, uh, with the context of a continuous and repeatable process, right? We don't, we want to make things as seamless as possible for our organization. We don't want to reinvent the wheel if we don't have to. Uh, we want to communicate among internal and external stakeholders about cybersecurity risks. Oftentimes, we know about the risks, but it's not always communicated properly to boards of directors or people in power to make that change. So, the NIST cybersecurity framework really boils down to five key tenets. We identify, protect, detect, respond, and then recover. And really, cybersecurity is a bit more complicated than that. Right, so even within NIST, we kind of break that out a little bit. When we identify, that includes asset management. What devices do you have on your network, right? There's many times I go out and do a consulting engagement. A client might say, hey, there's 600 devices on my network. So when you do an assessment, there'll be 600 devices. And I'm like, well, we found 900 devices. Did you think about including mobile phones that are on your network? And oftentimes they'll be like, no, we didn't but they're connected to your network. They are part of that asset management, right? And there's a lot of times when I go out, there'll be a client that says, I don't even know how many devices are on my network. So the, before we can protect anything, we have to know what we have, right? And that includes governments, risk assessment, risk management strategy, that all falls under identify. What we tend to do in industry is we focus very highly on protect. We want to protect our assets. We want to put in firewalls, put up more walls, more defenses, without really identifying what it is we want to protect. What data is most important to protect? What data are we obligated or should we protect? Do we have to protect all devices the same? Right? So is every device on your network holding the same amount of information? Probably not. Maybe more investment should go into the, protecting the devices that are critical to your network. And then that includes awareness and security training, data security, information protection. I won't go through them all uh, on this slide because we're gonna go through them in detail. Right? We wanna identify, as I said, we wanna know how many devices you have on your network, we wanna know what we wanna protect, and we wanna know what we don't want to protect. Maybe there's information that's not valuable or devices that aren't as worthy of protection. Oftentimes I'll go into a company and they'll say, well, we're gonna spend $300 per device. But maybe it makes more sense to spend $20 per device here and $1,000 for these critical devices over here. We can't get caught in this idea of this equilibrium bias, thinking we have to spend the same amount on every device. Because at the end of the day, our goal, and as the goal of this whole summit, we want to reduce or prevent ourselves from being breached or compromised. That is the goal. And all these frameworks and compliance and regulatory standards, they're all designed to get us to that goal. And sometimes I think as an industry, we get so caught up in all of these regulations that we miss out on the original spirit or the intention of the regulation to begin with. So we have to identify, again, what we're gonna protect before we can even protect it. Now software, what software do you use? Many companies I go into, they don't do a software inventory, and they should, right? Do you know every piece of software installed on your computers? Do you know when someone installs a new piece of software? Right, we'll get into detection then, but that's part of that. And do you know, have you identified all the cloud data? I've gone into lots of organizations, do you know how many accounts with your company's email address that your employees have created? In some cases, you could have dozens of accounts that an employee's created with your company's email address uh, without even knowing. So in sum, we cannot protect something we do not know about. Makes sense. Protection. Now this is the classical thing we think about protection. We think about antivirus, anti-malware, firewall, access controls processes and procedures. This gets lumped in along with the technology. Cybersecurity awareness training. Hint, this presentation is part of that, right? Everyone here is becoming more cyber aware, I hope so. 
And then there's too many others to include. You see it all the time, right? We have advanced machine learning. We have all kinds of devices and techniques, next generation firewalls to help improve us on protection. Those are needed in a comprehensive cybersecurity strategy. But here's something that we don't always think about. When we talk about protection, we need to talk about both physical and digital protection. The device up here on the left, uh, how many people here know what that device is? Couple people. So this was actually sold as a penetration testing or ethical hacking device several years ago. It was called the Pony Power Plug. And what's embedded in what looks like a surge protector is actually a hacking computer. And it was sold to consultants because a lot of cyber criminals will take devices and they can implant them in plain sight inside organizations. So we have to be aware of both the physical ramifications of where our jacks are, where our networks are, people could plug in. When people say internal, and I often hear this in an organization I go into, well, that's internal, that's on the internal network, so it doesn't need to be protected. But in reality, it does. Because if your physical security isn't good, someone could get in and plant a device and you wouldn't even know. I've done many tours on various data centers and had many opportunities to end up in prison. And thankfully, I never took any of those opportunities. So. I, those ones I tend to bypass, they're the bad ones. I try to stay with the good ones. But my point is, we need to look at physical as part of the cybersecurity landscape. As things start to merge, it's important that that falls under that category. And perhaps that's a conversation to have. I often recommend that the cybersecurity department should be interacting with physical security and working together. And the physical security, people in charge, the personnel, do need to be trained on these things, what to look out for, right? This is something we need to share information and be more collaborative on. And then we want to detect, right? We want to know when something happens. We don't want our data to just disappear. So when we think about detect, the word that comes up, and it's been used to death, right? We hear about SIMS. Security Incident and Event Management Systems. We talk about Security Operations Centers and SOCs. And what a lot of this is boiling down to is when something happens, we want to know about it, right? When someone logs in at 2 a.m. in the morning and they're not supposed to, we need an alert. And when we get all these alerts, we need to somehow figure out what is a good alert and what's a bad alert. And really, it's figuring out what's normal for a company. Right? We have to know what our normal organizational procedures are and then alert on those that aren't normal. So for detection, we really just want to know when something happens that would be important for us to know about. And then, of course, respond. When an incident does happen, what do we do? How fast can we respond to an incident? How fast is not fast enough? Is five minutes too long? Is 10 hours too long? Is seven days too long? The average is 140 days based off the presentation earlier. That's just too long. In critical infrastructure, it could be seconds. Two weeks ago, Hulu, a video streaming service for those who don't know, went down for about three hours. You would have thought the world was on fire. News lit up, oh my goodness, we can't stream video. And then, you know, Netflix stock going up because their video service is still up. We live in a society where even a second of downtime is too much. What are our procedures for response? I've gone into many organizations where they had an issue, and it was like, okay, Brandon, we've had a breach. I'm like, okay, so, so what are you doing right now? I don't know. That's why I'm asking you. There's a lot of organizations, we prepare for the worst, but we're not always prepared to respond when the worst happens. We need to have strict procedures in place. And I think this is something we can take from the military, where they have a contingency plan for everything. Right? It's one thing we can borrow a little bit, uh, you know, good or bad there. 
right? We want to have contingency plans in place. If this server goes down, what do we do? If we were breached tomorrow, who would be the first person you called? In fact, speaking of calling, do you have an on-call list? A list of people to call in the event of an emergency. Important things to have. The other thing to note is hackers often attack on holidays. They often do that on purpose because they know people aren't staffed. They attack on American holidays. So are you ready for an attack during those time periods? These are things we need to prepare for and be aware of to respond to. So we need to always have a contingency plan for the worst case scenario. And then when that worst case scenario happens, when we respond, part of that is we want to recover. Right? Backups, backups, and more backups. I can't stress it enough, right? And how many of us have had that incident where we had a backup where the backup didn't work? Right? So we almost need backups for backups. We need to test those backups. And when was the last time any of us had a recovery drill? These are important things we need to consider when we're talking about our organization and making sure we're resilient in our cybersecurity roadmap. So those are the five tenets, right, of, that make up the cybersecurity NIST framework. But there's more to it. We can actually learn from that and figure out kind of where we're at. What's our cybersecurity maturity? Do we, are we partially meeting these controls, right? Are we adequately, have we identified? Are we detecting most issues? Do we have adequate protection in place? Are we partial? We have a couple things, but there's lots of areas to improve on. Most people will fall in the first three tiers, right? But a lot fall in tier one especially. Tier two, we're risk informed. We know there's a risk. We're taking steps to fix those risks, but we're not quite there yet. We're not quite at the point where we have a repeatable process. A lot of organizations at this point too. And then tier three, this is where most should strive to be repeatable, right? There is a incident, there's a breach, there's an issue. We have all the documentation, we have all the staff, we have all the tools necessary to react to that situation. A lot of people don't fall into that category. But let's take that a step further. Let's talk about tier four, adaptive. Just from the name, I bet a lot of people can figure out what that means. Can we adapt to brand new threats? I'd like to point out a threat a couple years ago for anyone who remembers. Who remembers crack? That's the name of an attack. Okay, we have a couple. So for those who don't know what crack was, crack was a system-wide, it was a vulnerability discovered in most routers. Right, it was an issue with Wi-Fi communication standard, and it actually allowed people to eavesdrop on all Wi-Fi communications, even if they were encrypted. Right, this came out, it was a big deal for especially a lot of places that, hey, we have really secure communications that go over Wi-Fi. Uh, we, that's a problem. I remember at the organization I worked at the time, I was telling everyone, no one's allowed to use the Wi-Fi right now. And this company had almost all laptops, so that did not go over very well. Uh, so it was one of those things where we, it was an adaptable thing. Our organization had to adapt to that threat until we could get a proper patch in place. Because from that moment on, with that new vulnerability, we could not guarantee, and we really can't guarantee now, but we did not have a high enough level of confidence. We can't say the Wi-Fi traffic going over our corporate Wi-Fi can't be intercepted right now because it's publicly available and people know how to use the exploit. That's tier four. We need to be able to adapt to those attacks. Another attack that's rather new the past few years, who here has heard of crypto jacking? Couple people. So crypto jacking is when malware installs on your computer, or it might even just run in your browser using JavaScript, and it actually mines cryptocurrency, right? We had this come up a couple times in a couple organizations I worked in where phones were blowing up. People had these crypto miners running on their phones, not that they installed, but that a criminal installed on them. Right, all of a sudden, why, Brandon, why is our electric bill up $10,000 this month? Crypto jacking. 
That was a brand new threat that had to be responded to. So, talked about our maturity model, we've talked about kind of the, the NIST cybersecurity framework, but how do we really get there? So here's our roadmap. First, we're gonna prioritize and scope. What areas are the most important to fix? And I always say you wanna solve the low hanging fruit. And one of the best ways to do that is patch, right? And I'm sure you've all heard this before. You wanna patch all your systems because that is the easiest way you can protect a lot of your systems. Get them up to date on the latest patch. And I'm not just talking about your Windows systems, but I mean routers, firmware, check the security on those and patch. If you can patch all of your systems, you eliminate probably over 80% of your threat landscape just by doing that. Next thing, prioritize, right? Do you have Windows XP machines still in service? Do you have Server 2003 machines still in service? Did you know most of the ATM machines are still running Windows XP? Scary world. We need to prioritize that and plan and scope. And then after we've prioritized and scoped, then we need to pivot our organization, orient in that direction. Once we do that, we create a current profile. What is our current Cybersecurity. Here's what we're doing right, right now. Here are things we can improve. Once we're at that point, we conduct a full risk assessment. Right? Where are all of our risks? Once we think we know where we're at, let's verify that with a risk assessment. Then we want to create our target, set timelines, set dates. Cybersecurity moves fast. If you spend just six months planning you might be too late because the landscape may have completely changed. Then we want to determine, analyze, and prioritize our gap. After we've created a target profile, this is where we want to go. Here's our three-year plan. How do we get there? And we do this the same way a business might do their three-year plan for creating profit, right? But from a cybersecurity standpoint, this is our technical debt or security debt, so to speak of our organization, here are our gaps, and here's our plan to fix it. And then, last but not least, and most important, we actually have to do the work. We have to implement a plan of action. There is monetary spending involved here that some of us don't always have, and some organizations don't have, and some of that process could be hard fought just to show, hey, we need this money or this budget to fill these gaps because of these risks. So how do we do this change, right? Change is hard. Nobody likes change, right? I was devastated when Subway took away their chicken parm sub. I got that for years. That's a change I'm still dealing with today, emotional scars. Right. So organizational buy-in is needed, right? So change is very difficult. So you have to have buy-in of an organization. If your organization says no to cybersecurity, It'll suffer the consequences. So part of that is you have to align cybersecurity with your organizational goals and make it one of those goals. If it's part of the strategic plan of the organization to improve your cybersecurity, then amazingly, it will start to improve, right? Because that is a goal, it's an objective like anything else. We need to work on a we are in this together mentality or attitude. It works better than what I call draconian imperialism. Right? Do this because I'm the security guy, and I said so. This is the best way to do it. We need to have empathy and compassion. We're dealing with people, right? I, I often hear the word all the time, and I think we use it too often. We use the word users instead of people. Because at the end of the day, these are people. They have feelings. They have emotions. We need to tap into that. We need people to want to improve the security of the organization. We don't want this to be a pain or an inconvenience. You want this because it's gonna protect you personally and professionally. So for this to succeed, cultural change is needed for organizations to succeed, right? We talked about this this morning. You have to change your DNA. Well, how do we do that? How do we change someone's DNA? How do we change culture? 
So one of that is education is key to cultural change. If you don't know the threat exists, then it's, uh, it's not a big deal because you don't know. So education is really key. Most people don't understand the threats. Oftentimes, I tell a lot of friends, families, colleague, uh, colleague members, I talk about public Wi-Fi. And I often am educating them, did you know on public Wi-Fi, you can be intercepted, all your communication? And they'll say, Brandon, nah, uh I do Facebook and banking all the time at my local Starbucks. That's my place. And I was like, well, that's not safe. How do you know it's not compromised? I don't. Well, well Starbucks, I'm sure they invest the proper money in their public Wi-Fi. I'm like, no, they don't. They make no money off that public Wi-Fi, right? They're not investing any money there. So I, I tell everyone, educate your fellow human beings, right? The other people. Even sharing that bit of information that someone doesn't know about can really change and open someone's eyes in their world. You gotta make the threat personal. With the Equifax threat, almost every single one of us in here, I almost guarantee every single person's personal data was stolen. Doesn't that make you angry? It makes me angry. This is like the fifth time my personal information's gotten stolen. I got like eight alerts, you know, every other day. It's like, just letting you know, Brandon, your personal information was stolen again. And we just had five more people try and use your credit card. You know, and it's gotten to the point where sometimes I go to the store and I try and use a credit card. I'm out of state, I'm traveling. And it even says, oh, can't use that. And then I'll get the alert on my phone. Brandon, we just stopped someone from trying to use your credit card. I was like, well, gee, I guess I'm going without the Dr. Pepper today, huh? Mm. Right? These threats are real and they affect us all personally in a very personal way. So we need to confront them. For me, I started in IT security. I had a website, 33,000 users. It got hacked. And this was back in the day where we used AIM and MSN. No judgment, right? It's all we had. And they actually were trying to ransom the website back to me. They were making fun of me over Instant Messenger. And I didn't know a lot about cybersecurity back then. Other than that, I had just lost everything. And like everything, my backups didn't work or were corrupted. So eventually, the, they felt bad for me, and they gave me a backup that I spent hours trying to use to restore my website. And it was never the same. And ever since then, I've always had a personal vendetta against cyber criminals. It's a big thing when you make it personal. So I tell everyone, make that threat personal for everyone. We should all be angry. All of our data has been compromised. We have to create a mindset of proactive processes versus reactive. Oftentimes, there's a breach, and then we'll make investments. But it costs a lot more to make those investments afterward than it does to make them beforehand. We have to be proactive in our industry because the cyber criminals are being proactive. Right now, they are investing, and I say investing because for them it's a criminal enterprise in new technology, in machine learning, in ways that they can be more profitable. In fact, for them, cybercrime is overtaking the drug trade in profitability. The mafia is now becoming really a bunch of cyber criminals because it's more profitable to do that than drug trading very serious. We need to take these things very seriously. So we have to change the culture of an organization. And that is not easy. I've spent years inside an organization trying to change the culture and have had success. But it takes time. It takes diligence. You have to be very stern sometimes. And that's it for my presentation. What questions do you have for me? Not everyone at once.
so the question was, and correct me if I'm wrong here, I might be paraphrasing a little bit, how can we be sure that the cybersecurity investments we make this week won't be out of date next week? And how can we give our executive management or board uh, understanding to know that these are the proper investments? And one thing I like to say is the methodology doesn't really change, the tools do. And sometimes the processes do. But the processes and procedures are really the same thing. Even a lot of the hacks we see today, a lot of the hacking, it hasn't really changed. It's still the same thing as we had in the 90s. And I'd even venture to say since about 2005, since a lot of more of the, the hacking tools were kind of standardized and have become more standardized, they haven't really changed. So the hackers are still getting in the same ways, right? They're getting in through compromising some computer somewhere, using that as a pivot point to get to other computers. And as long as you craft, that's really, I think, the narrative you need to craft, right, is this is the way criminals are getting into systems. These are the attacks we're facing. And this is the current tool set of technologies, and this is how it's going to help prevent those attacks. It's impossible to make any guarantees of where the industry is going. But I can say with sound fundamental practices in cybersecurity, you can get fairly far. Because a lot of that still hasn't changed, right? I mean, what were we saying 10 years ago? Patch your systems. What were we saying 20 years ago? Patch your systems. And today, we're still saying, please, please patch your systems, right? And again, that's not always easy, right? I might have a legacy application that only runs on Windows 95. And maybe it controls a critical component. Maybe it controls something in the power grid. And I have no information, right? This is just an example. Right? Just, just throwing that out there. And we can't replace it, right? Because that can't go down, right? People will get upset when their power goes out for some reason. Uh, but those are the threats we face. And I think that's the narrative across. You need to have those strong fundamental uh, principles and methodology in place. The, this is what we're trying to protect. Here's the tools that we're using to protect those things. I think that will help in the long run, but it's impossible to make any guarantees. But you can know that you're making some improvement. Like I said, I said one of the things I think is education is important for everyone in your organization, not just cybersecurity professionals. I think making it, uh, making it personal is important, but also a reward system. So I found in organizations I've worked with, working with different teams, uh, a box of pizza can go a long way to, to help with understanding and actually opening people up and getting people talking. Right? And in general, I find if you give someone a chocolate bar, they'll like you a little bit more in general. So it's just my experience. But I think those are kind of some of the things we need to do. We need to be partnered with different people. And that, that's hard to do sometimes, because sometimes we work with people we don't always like the people we work with. Right? I can name lots of people, and I won't, uh, that I've worked with that I don't necessarily enjoy working with. But at the end of the day, we have to get along and collaborate, right? And, and there's times when you even work with competitors and have to collaborate. I often say that cybersecurity professionals in general need to collaborate more across sectors uh, in all kinds of different industries. So I think it's something that we need to build a foundation of collaboration. It's not an easy thing, right? We gotta foster that, that proper culture and that proper mindset. Uh, when it comes to reactive, to get executive board members to kind of see the reason, I think you look at the numbers, right? So you look at the numbers of breach, you can actually have some real metrics. One of the things that I've done in past organizations is actually create metrics for my cybersecurity program. So here's how many infections we had this year that are antivirus caught. Here's how many infections we had that our antivirus didn't catch. Right, because that 99.9% .9 still leaves 0.1%. And you can figure out, if you have 200,000 connections per second, 
Uh, at what point that 0.1% becomes a reality. And I actually had that happen to me. We did that calculation, an organization I worked for, right? And we figured out we'd have two pieces of malware that would make it through our systems every year that our AV wouldn't be able to detect. And wouldn't you know, we had two pieces of malware that year that made it through our systems that our AV wasn't able to protect. So I think if you create those metrics and really foster that, say this is why we need to be more reactive in our processes, I think that will go a long way to increasing uh, buy-in from a corporation standard, right? For, uh, at least from a budgetary perspective. Right now, sometimes you're still going to have users that are somewhat toxic to an organization when it comes to cybersecurity. They're not going to care about cybersecurity. Right? And if you do everything you possibly can to get them on board with cybersecurity and they just won't come along no matter what you do, you know, sometimes that's a greater conversation. Right? Sometimes that becomes a point where this is a strategic initiative for the organization. And you have to get people on board. And if you don't, then that's a threat. I worked for an organization where they actually had someone working in the organization who actively despised the organization. And they knew this. And I said, so why is this person here? Well, uh, we can't get rid of Jake. I mean, he's, you know, Jake's a great guy. And I was like, he's a great guy, but he actively hates the organization. He talks bad about every second he gets. And, you know, he's compromising that. We have to take those threats seriously. I mean, imagine if someone for a second thought that uh, Mr. Snowden was going to do what he thought he was going to do, right? Or had any inkling that he might actually leak some of that information. Could be a very different world we live in today, or at least a very different relationship than many people have with the NSA today. So hopefully that answers that a little bit. And, and it is difficult to get buy-in in that, and I think part of that is explaining the reasoning behind it. Because you have companies where, I'm sure we've all heard this, why do we have that policy? That is such a dumb policy. Who came up with that? And I think the reason you hear that a lot in organizations is because they weren't in the room when they discussed why that policy was in place or put in place. And I like to say that every policy that was implemented normally has a reason. Whether it's a good reason or a bad reason is a different story, but normally it has a reason. I think uh, that conversation needs to be had at a deeper level with the organization. I've met organizations where they're doing that, right? We're gluing all of the USB ports shut, and they go to that extent. But I think a greater thing is, if you do that, you get to that point where you're going to have people start to do bad things because they'll rebel somewhat against that approach. And I think what we need to do, again, is we need to train people on this stuff. They need to know that it's a great threat. And yes, we can try and supplement with tools to detect when people plug things in and different group policies and different procedures. But I think it really comes back to educating those users and making them a part of that DNA and a part of that organization where they want to. Uh, a new hacking device that recently it's actually up for investment on one of those platforms like Indiegogo. It's actually a iPhone charging device with a hacking backdoor built into it. So it looks just like a lightning cable, except if someone plugs into the computer, it's now a backdoor into that system. So we need to be training people on these things. These devices, the hardware attacks are ever increasing and people need to be aware of it.
there's nothing to say that there isn't. It very well could be. And that, no, it's, it's, it's a great question. And part of that, there is a supply chain issue, right? There's a big issue in how we're currently doing digital security. There's a big issue in how we're doing hardware security. Did you know a lot of locks for doors, you can buy a master key on Amazon for like $5? Yeah, different types of locks. You can actually buy master keys from online, Amazon. Look it up. It will frighten you. Right? I think, and it, I honestly think sometimes we take cybersecurity more seriously than physical security. And I'm not a physical security professional, but I've just seen some of these things. I've been to some of the conventions, right? And I think we need to uh, understand that when we're using a computer, or we're using these digital assets, it is very fragile information, right? A lot of the technology that we're built on top of is decades old, right? TCP IP or the communication protocol we're using was fundamentally developed, you know, decades ago. It's old, it's outdated, but you can't just rip and replace the entire internet's architecture and replace it with something better. We've been trying to do that for years with this thing called IPv6. We're not getting very far. For those who remember when that was first introduced a couple decades ago, and for those who are curious, a lot of hackers and cyber criminals have already figured out ways to hack IPv6. So once we get there, the exploits will be waiting. Absolutely. So I, I think making it personal and sharing that information with as many people as possible. I, I share it with family and friends all the time. Right? I, I sent an email out during that crack uh, incident, that vulnerability. I sent a message to my parents. I said, don't do your banking on Wi-Fi right now. Tell you more later. And that's all I could send to them. And obviously... They are, they are opposite of technology, so I, I can't even describe. My dad will be very, is always very impressed. He's like, Brandon, see how fast I can type with two fingers. <laughs> and I'm like, Dad, please stop. Please, just stop. You're not impressing anyone. All right, even the computer is frowning. All right, like this is, this is just sad. Uh, but no, they were like, what's, I don't understand, Brandon. I don't understand what that means. And I think there needs to be really almost like a radical revolution in the way we're doing education. And maybe gamification is the way, as it was discussed earlier today. But more people need to be security aware. And it's not that we're trying to turn people into security engineers, right? I don't think everyone in the world can be a cybersecurity engineer, or should be. But I think everyone can have a little bit of knowledge that can go a long way to both improving uh, yourself and protecting your data from a personal level and for protecting your organization or company you work for. And I think that's really the goal we want to hit. All right, we got time for one more question. I will try and sum it up in the best I can in about 30 to 45 seconds. So here's my, my take, my professional opinion on the cloud. So whenever you're outsourcing anything to the cloud, you're still on hardware. In fact, sometimes people say the joke, the cloud is just someone else's computer, because at the end of the day, it really is just someone else's computer. When you give up control, to someone else, 
right? And this, it's a lot cheaper, right? I don't have to have a server now. I don't have to have all these desktop computers. It's just all on someone else's computer. The issue is, again, you give up control. So I think the way to temper it with cloud is you can move to cloud, but know that the risk you are taking is you are giving up control and the amount of additional costs that you have to put into insights in that control is going to be, needs to be part of your cost benefit calculation. So I think that's one of the, the best ways to address cloud uh, for, from my take. So. Well, I, I could go on for about three hours about how I feel about phones, but I will just say that I hope no one has the impression at all that your phones are in any way, shape, or form secure in any meaning of the word. All right, the question was, if I lose data in the cloud, am I still responsible for it? And really, the answer is yes. I mean, it's your data, but it's on someone else's architecture. You're renting that architecture. If I lease a car and I crash in that car, I'm not going to say, well, I was leasing it. That's not my problem, right? Uh, no, it's going to be my problem, right? So if you're in the cloud and your data gets hacked, it's not on the cloud provider so much. And they'll tell you, yeah, it's not on us. It's more on you. And again, they'll probably take some flack for it, but a lot of cloud providers, AWS, Azure, they have a lot of great security tools. And they often charge more for them. Uh, but they have a lot of the tools out there. So you can take advantage of them. So I think when you're talking about cloud and cloud strategy, you need to have that cybersecurity mindset and focus, and you need to ask more questions. And just like every computer is different, I hope no one here thinks every cloud is the same. Because at the end of the day, every cloud is just some other collection of computers or servers sitting somewhere else. So I think we need to be more cautious and ask more questions when we're approaching that. All right, thank you guys, appreciate it.